Hi, Rui. Hi, Rui. Hi, Ryan. How are you? I'm doing good, and you? Uh, not bad. So I guess we should introduce ourselves. You want to go ahead? Well, uh, I'm Rui Teixeira. Um, I'm a visiting fellow at uh, Brookings and a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress and the Century Foundation and probably a few other places I've forgotten. Uh, <laughs> and I write about politics, public opinion, and I'm, I do a lot these days in political demography and geography and try to suss out what's going to happen politically in this great nation of ours in the years to come. Uh, I'm going to have my, my computer uh, give my introduction. Uh, <laughs> I hope you can hear it. Okay. Oh, damn, it didn't work. <laughs> well, Wait, let te- me, let me... technical glitches. Maybe the death of us all. Wait, I've been plagued by many of them today. Wait, let me just give it one more try. Rai uh, Han Salon is an associate editor at The Atlantic and a fellow at the New America Foundation. He is the co-author of Grand New Party, and he blogs at the American scene. Also, he likes to talk in a robot voice. Well, this I is really one reason why robots won't replace people. Soon, <laughs> I, I can't get over making my uh, computer read out text. It really <laughs> is just the great... The uh-huh. central pleasure of my life. So, Rui, I mean, you've become an incredibly hot commodity because you're the person who has divined the secret to this election, and really all elections uh, for many decades now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and can you tell us what that secret is? Uh, gee, I, I wasn't aware I had figured it out. <laughs> I mean, all I do is I, I try to look at uh, the underlying trends with the electorate, and you know, some of those were described in the emerging Democratic majority about these... Uh, sort of growth constituencies that looked like they were going to give Democrats big majorities for some years to come. And if you looked at how the electorate was changing in terms of the mix of groups, I mean, all of this looked pretty good for the Democrats. And then I also argued, of course, that the white working class, while a declining group, and I have a lengthy paper out about this that's available on the web called The Decline of the White Working Class and the Rise of an Upper Mass Upper Middle Class, uh, uh, despite their strength among these emerging constituencies, Democrats could conceivably be derailed in, in any given election by uh, the other side being able to attain not just majorities but supermajorities of the votes of, of these, these kinds of voters. And, in fact, that is what happened in 2000 and 2004. That turned around in 2006, and now in 2008 everybody's arguing about on the Democratic side, well, who can reach the white working class because they look at the election results in the primaries and they infer from the fact that Obama has had trouble getting white working class voters to vote for him in most states over Hillary Clinton that he won't be able to do well enough among these voters in uh, the general election to to win it. So I wouldn't say that I've got the secrets, but I've got... (laughs) Do I, it's one of these things, do I know all the, all the answers? Heck, I don't even know all the questions, but I do at least know some of the right questions to ask, and, and those are some of the questions, I think. But certainly since you started working uh, on the question of the white working class, I mean, this idea that the white working class is the Rosetta Stone uh, for understanding uh, intra-democratic politics as well as politics more broadly seems to have, you know, gained a lot of uh, credence. Um, and you know, one, one question I have mm-hmm. for you is if you look at uh, Kentucky and Oregon, you see that in Oregon, Obama actually did pretty well with the white working class, yeah, whereas split in Kentucky. Them. Right. Yeah, so tell me a bit about that. I mean, what do you think is at work there, and, and what do you think is, uh, is going on? Well, uh, John and I talked about this a little bit in our book, John, Judas and I, is that if you looked at white working class voters in different areas of the country, they, they acted quite differently, certainly the most conservative in the South, the most conservative in rural areas. In more cosmopolitan states and cosmopolitan regions, particularly around large, technically advanced metropolitan areas, they tend to be actually... Uh, you know, if not certainly much less uh, conservative than those other areas, and in many uh, they're actually quite democratic. So the white working class itself is uh, varies by the region of country. It varies by age. It varies by how much education they have. But one thing that's quite noticeable in the uh, data, for even from the primary elections, is that uh, white working class voters that have at least some college, you might describe them as the more, uh, they're certainly the more educated, more cosmopolitan, more upwardly mobile, elements of the white working class are actually much more sympathetic to Obama than those with a high school degree or less who are, uh, you know, less skilled or bigger losers and, and have a, a tougher hill to climb economically. So, um, you know, you look at Oregon, you look at Kentucky, you look at the types of white working class voters uh, they have there, you look at how Oregon differs from Kentucky, you kind of factor all that stuff in and it doesn't seem so crazy that it'd be 
uh, do pretty adequately among white working class voters in a state like Oregon, but get pounded in a place like Kentucky. But, you know, it, 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 in th those states, it really is a matter of um, the kind of working class voters, because there's not that much difference, and this was not well understood in the coverage of the two elections, that there's about as, there's almost as many white working class voters in Oregon as there are in Kentucky. Kentucky is about 70 percent, I would estimate about 70 percent white working class voters in this coming election, whereas Oregon is still about 64 percent. So they're, they're pretty close. Yeah, that is really striking. And also, I'll bet in a state like Oregon, I mean, you have the folks who used to be in the timber sector, but then you also have people who are non-college educated, technically don't have four-year degrees, but who are working in the upper echelons of the service economy, who are obviously going to see the world pretty differently. That's I'll right. Those skews are, are pretty different from state absolutely, to state. Absolutely, absolutely. So that's why I find some of the discussion about it in the media somewhat frustrating, because those, those differences get elided, and uh, in fact, they only seem dimly aware they could possibly exist. I think in the minds of a lot of folks covering this issue and writing about it, uh, when we talk about the white working class, we must mean people who have blue-collar jobs who either work in manufacturing or, or just, you know, used to work in manufacturing a few, a few years ago. And, uh, in fact, the data tell us that uh, white working class voters are much more likely to have a low-level white collar or service job than to be blue collar. I think only about a sixth of them work in, in manufacturing at this point. You know, Seventy percent are in the service sector. Only thirty percent are in, uh, you know, the goods pro goods production uh, sector generally, which includes manufacturing, mining, construction, uh, farm, and so on. So, you know, people just. They, they don't. Have, I mean, we always talk about diversity, but the white working class exhibits quite a lot of diversity too. And it would be useful if, uh, in discussions, people recognize this fact. Well, it seems that you know the group is actually so variegated that you wonder if it even makes sense to think of it as a single group. I mean, would you? Do you think it analytically makes sense to separate out people with some college, for example, as an entirely separate constituency? And you know, it, and which was the, is the constituency? I mean, you know, that would you say within the white working class that is most likely to swing between Democrats and Republicans? Is there such a group? Well, in terms of uh, actual political behavior, recently, typically high school dropouts tend to be more democratic, and uh, at least in recent elections, though I think this may be changing, and will be interesting to see if it changes this election, those with some college were even more conservative than those who had a high school diploma only. So, I mean, I would be interested to see in this election if the whites with some college, who, as you're pointing out, are, are an interesting and somewhat distinct group, if they actually move toward the Democrats uh, more than, than whites with a high school diploma. I think that would be interesting. And if that was the case, then that would very much benefit the Democrats in general. It would benefit them in some of these swing states like Pennsylvania that I looked at recently in a long analysis I did with Bill Fry. Um, if they can move those voters in their direction, I mean, that's another piece of their majority coalition because whites with some college are actually a growth constituency. Whites with below who, who don't have any college education at all, those with a high school diploma and, of course, high school dropouts, not a growth constituency. So yeah. if you want to make inroads into the white working class and develop a solider base among them, making progress among these whites with some college could, could, be pretty, could be pretty critical. Now, would it be good to break them out as a separate group? I mean, I'm all for more information allows us to break out as many groups as possible. I'm actually quite pleased that we're, we're finally getting to the point where uh, polls and uh, newspapers are starting to look at whites with, you know, non-college whites, whites without a four-year college degree as a proxy for the white working class. I've been talking about it for years. I've argued it's important. I wrote a whole book about it, and it's nice to see uh, that analytical category out there. It might be asking a bit much of them to subdivide the white working <laughs> class into the upper and, and, and sort of lower white working class, so I'm sure that would be quite interesting, and I would applaud it if it was done. So... You mentioned this project that you were working on with Bill Fry when mm -hmm. you looked at Pennsylvania. My understanding is that you're going to look at a, a whole series of states. Um, that is correct, my, my publicist, <laughs> Raihan. <laughs> Funny you should ask that question. Are you looking at 12? <laughs> are you looking at uh, sort of, uh, how many states are you looking at? Well, we started looking at 10, and now it's, it's crept up to 11 because um, our next report, and watch out for this one, Kitty, so it's going to be on the Intermountain West. And we were going to do in the Intermountain West, Arizona, Colorado, and Nevada. But as we 
we've been working on it for a while, and we felt, oh, geez, if we're going to do this, we might as well do New Mexico, which is obviously right on the edge politically, even though Arizona is a bigger and more interesting state over the long haul. Yeah. So we decided we'd throw New Mexico into the mix. So, that re- so our report will cover those four states, and I suspect it'll come out sometime in early July. Right now we're crunching the numbers for it. Uh, we're up to our elbows in it. There's a lot of ugly stuff when you try to try to use some of these census geographies for the American Community Survey, which I, I assure you, you don't want to know about. But it's, it's <laughs> quite complicated. And makes, well, I might want to know about it. I don't right, know if our listeners no want to know about no it. Uh, watching this <laughs> but anyway, now we're hard at work. Um, you know, we, uh, we're being very productive, and we hope this uh, report will come out soon. But, you know, everybody should try to get a hold of a copy of the Pennsylvania report, which is out there on the web on the Brookings site. And it's pretty interesting, pretty interesting. In fact, we were just talking about that issue of whites with some college. And it turns out in Pennsylvania, whites with some college have been moving in the Democratic direction over the last 20 years or so. So that's a potential factor for them. And there's a lot of other interesting stuff uh, in, the, in the report that would suggest, by and large, Pennsylvania may be poised on the brink of going from a purple-leaning blue state to possibly a, you know, a much more solid blue state. There's a lot of trends in the Democrats' favor. I mean, what's been good for the Republicans is that in the western part of the state, they've done uh, very well, uh, and they've sort of been able to counterbalance some of the gains in the, of the Democrats in the Philly suburbs and more, more upscale uh, parts of Pennsylvania. And we also argue that the Allentown, Scranton, Reading region, that whole northeast region, is pretty critical to, uh, to Democrats' uh, fate. So now, there's a lot of moving parts there, but a lot of them seem to be moving in the in the Democrats' direction, and it's sort of a microcosm of where the Republicans are uh, in terms of the, arguably in terms of the country as a whole. To to sort of keep those trends at bay, they need in the parts of the state they're strongest in, they need to win ever larger supermajorities of the white working class vote. So that's a challenge. It's either that or basically do a big pushback, uh, you know, in the Philly suburbs and probably also in the Harrisburg. So when we're looking at uh, Western Pennsylvania and we're looking at the kind of voters that Republicans have been winning over, Mm -hmm. are we talking about those without any college, the high school dropouts and the high school graduates, um, you know, for Republicans? Or, you know, what is the source of their relative advantage there? In Actually, in the Western part of the state, the Republicans uh, and also in parts of the T, uh, the Republicans have done quite well among all sectors of the white working class. It's only in the, it's mostly in the eastern part of the state that whites with some college have moved in the democratic I see, I see. direction. And that could be so would you say I mean northeastern Pennsylvania my understanding is that there is some growth uh, spillover growth from uh, neighboring metropolitan areas but also some growth in uh, biomedical innovation and also in the kind of academic research sector. I mean could it be that the area has seen some growth in some college whites who are in the uh, in the service sector, or yes, what is it? Right. I mean, at, at that. I mean, it's hard to drill down quite that far. But yes, I, we do believe that that's part of what's going on. There is that uh, the white working class in, in in that area is becoming increasingly weighted toward sort of upper white working class voters with some technical education and work in uh, technically advanced service uh, industries and so on. And and they they don't at all look like uh, the stereotype of the white working class voter in those areas, which was, you know, they work in one of the last remaining uh, steel, you know, some auto parts plant or they're my, you know. Yeah. I mean, the play, that area is going through quite a, sh- a, a rapid transition. And the image of what people in those areas do is not caught up at all with the reality. Yeah, we're living here in Allentown and they're closing all the factories down. <laughs> but, they're, but they're opening the hospitals and the academic research centers, et cetera. So in the emerging Democratic majority, you talked about, uh, if I recall correctly, the Technopolis. And the Ideopolis. Have, uh, the Ideopolis. Mm-hmm. And, you know, is it, would you say that, you know, it's a phenomenon where in an Ideopolis, in, say, Raleigh-Durham, mm-hmm. areas like this, that the norms shift so that, you know, for example, you have groups that follow, um, say, the upper middle class, uh, in their pre- political proclivities simply by virtue of who your neighbors are. I mean, is that part of what's going on, a story where, you know, your peers, the people around you are moving in one direction and people get swept along that way? 
I think that's definitely part of it. It's a proximity kind of thing. It reflects uh, the, the culture of the whole area, which is more cosmopolitan, more, more tolerant. There's obviously typically more diversity. Uh, people are involved in, in different kinds of jobs, as we were just talking about. And um, it creates an atmosphere where, you know, the white work, work, people who might be considered part of the white working class uh, just are, you know, sort of cheek by jowl with people uh, in a different kind of cultural uh, mindset. And, yes, yeah. I think some of it does transfer over to you these think voters. That I mean, they're still going to be conflict. more conservative than the professionals, yeah. for example, in that area. And, and obviously, in a political sense, they'll be more conservative than the minorities in those yeah. areas. But nevertheless, compared to their counterparts, uh, you know, in, in a lot of other parts of the country, uh, they're going to tend to be much more more liberal. Even other parts of North Carolina, if we're going to talk specifically about North Carolina, that's part yeah. of the reason why the Research Triangle area has moved in the direction it has, why Mecklenburg County around Charlotte has moved in the direction that it has. Uh, not only do you have a different mix of, of voters in general in these these areas, in these counties, but uh, the more you know, the, the sort of the groups like the white working class uh, evolve as well uh, politically, in yeah. addition to the, just the mix of voters changing. Yeah, it's interesting. David Sirota has uh, offered his hypothesis or his, you know, kind of narrative for explaining the uh, primary race. And uh, he has advanced this idea of the race chasm uh, that in states with a history of uh, kind of racial political conflict, mm -hmm. um, particularly states uh, that have between uh, 7 and 13 percent black populations, these are states where Clinton has done particularly well through racial appeals. In states with uh, smaller black populations or larger black populations, you know, either a kind of increased turnout of, of black voters or, you know, kind of this absence of black-white racial conflict. Um, it's an interesting idea. I mean, the trouble that I had with it is that it just seems very slippery. There seem to be other explanations that could just as easily yeah, kind of yeah. account I mean, for it. Why does it all have to be about race? I mean, on the most obvious level, it's simply a correlation. I mean, it doesn't show that feelings about race are therefore driving things. As you point out, there are other things that may be involved here. And our, I mean, even views about race are rarely just about race. I mean, that's well, but one the problem question I, I had is about yeah. the Ideopolis idea mm -hmm. is that, you know, you kind of uh, are talking about the Ideopolis as a place where you have a, a good deal of diversity mm -hmm. and this leads to more tolerance. But couldn't the opposite be true, you know, in a uh, metropolitan area? I mean, it seems that when you're looking at Southern California, you had a lot of out-migration of native-born whites as you had a large immigrant influx. So maybe that sorting actually means that those who remain behind well, we know tend to be more tolerant. But mm -hmm. Well, we know from uh, other studies that the most hostility toward immigrants isn't where there are, with some exceptions, like right at the border, um, isn't where there are a lot of immigrants, but there were rel relatively few. Yeah. I mean, like, for example, you see much less of it in Montgomery County, where there's tons of immigrants, than you see in, like, Loudoun County, where <laughs> there's sort of an emerging group. So, yeah. you know, the, the, the more cosmopolitan, diverse uh, areas in these, in these states are going to be areas where uh, you know, I think that it's really less of a problem than in the areas that are a little bit farther removed from where the action is, the yeah. rural areas, the outer suburbs, and so on. And this is where you might see the most concern about the problems of, you know, sort of the, the center of these areas moving out to the, to the periphery. It's kind of like enough familiarity to be worried, yeah. but not so much familiarity that, you know, it starts to not be such a big deal. And also, I guess that once you get to the point where you have that much diversity within the county, you've already had the sorting out of the people who, you know. That's right. The people yeah. who really don't want to be there, <laughs> they even go somewhere else. <laughs> I don't know why I find this idea so funny. <laughs> so uh, now, one question I have for you, you, uh, you know, started, you've been participating in public life for a long time, but you know, one piece that really put you on the map as a public commentator was a piece you wrote in the wake of uh, Michael Dukakis' defeat, uh, if I understand correctly. And it was just about this idea that Jesse Jackson was going to be able to excite new constituencies and bring new voters um, into right, the electorate. Michael Dukakis lost the 88 election because he didn't bring enough new voters into the process. Uh, that would, you know, turnout wasn't high enough among Yeah. Them. So, yeah, no, I thought that was pretty goofy, and I just ran some numbers that, that showed it was about as wrong as you can get in well, terms of political analysis. One question I have for you, though, is, you know, if you look at the recent uh, string of special elections, 
in which Republicans in heavily pro-Bush districts have been defeated mm -hmm. um, by their Democratic opponents. One of them was in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there is this idea, this hopeful idea among some Democrats that even in, you know, deep South states, there is some possibility that increased black turnout, even if it doesn't mean that the states will go to, say, the Democratic presidential nominee, it could mean that you're going to flip a lot of congressional seats. Do you see that as a real possibility uh, of black turnout increasing that dramatically? Well, it all depends on the composition of the district and how close it might otherwise be. I mean, it, it, it's, it's typically the case that it, it's hard to get turnout up far enough among just blacks to tip an election all by itself. I mean, if it's already close, then that makes more sense. If it's not particularly close, then you've got to also be talking about moving the whites yeah. in the area toward the Democrats. So, you know, classic situation where they can afford to run a deficit among white voters. I mean, this is, you know, we're just, we don't know what kind of district we're really talking about here, but, uh, but they can't afford to get clobbered too badly. So, I mean, I, I assume the theory is more in these districts that Democrats get a big black turnout and right. they're actually able to reduce their deficit somewhat among white voters just because white voters, like most voters, are pretty ticked off with the GOP these days. One thing that I really appreciate... But certainly black is, turnout yeah. can help put them in play is, you know, that you're always very, very careful about that stuff. And there's good reason to be because, you know, one thing that I always think about is how in California uh, black voters are actually overrepresented as a share of the electorate relative to their share in the general population for the obvious reason that Latinos, you know, are relatively mm -hmm. unrepresented among the electorate, et cetera. And also because this is a fairly highly politically mobilized uh, community there. And, of course, that doesn't obtain in plenty of other metropolitan areas and plenty of other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean... But I have well, to black say, black turnout I mean, is not that low. Yeah. Once you control for the other demographic characteristics of the black population, somewhat younger, poor, less educated, and so on. Um, in fact, their turnouts about where you would expect it to be. Simply, I mean, that's not to say it couldn't go up. Yeah. But uh, it's just it's just not the case that they're sort of underperforming relative to the kind of population it is. So, I mean, that's one reason why to be skeptical that black turnout at least on a long-term sense, could go up that dramatically. Uh, now, in this election, it certainly could go up a lot, uh, just because of the special nature of, of Obama's candidacy. But, uh, you know, what I've always argued about going back 20 years is that the Democrats' real solution to their problems is to get more of their constituencies to the polls. And, you know, if only these people were brought to the polls... Democrats would be different, the country would be different, politics would be different. I tend not to believe that. So uh, tell me, I mean, you've been watching elections for a really long time. Has there ever been a time when you feel like a vice presidential candidate has made a difference? Uh, I've really made a difference. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, not, I'm sure there might have been, you know, a state here and there that you could ascribe to a vice presidential candidate. You know, I think the Clinton-Gore thing kind of added to the narrative a little bit to have Gore be his sidekick. But was it determinative? I really doubt it. I really doubt it. So, yeah, I think people love to discuss vice presidential <laughs> just because it's, it's kind of a cool handicapping game, but its actual significance is, is probably fairly minimal. And, and that's, what, that's what the academic studies all say, and I'm inclined yeah. to believe them, that it's uh, at the margin it's – could you know maybe maybe be important you know in a, in a small sense but uh, unless you're talking about an election where everything else is close then it's not going to matter that much sadly i agree with you which means that any irresponsible vice presidential speculation on our parts will perhaps be misplaced right right well so now that we've gotten that out of the way it doesn't matter uh, who do you think the democrats are <laughs> well, I mean, one thing actually in defense of vice presidential, irresponsible vice presidential speculation is that I do think that it actually tells you something about the candidate and their theory of the electorate mm -hmm. and their yeah, theory so of what they're lacking. I, I certainly think that when you look at, you know, selecting Dick Cheney told us a lot. In fact, in hindsight, you know, some very worrisome <laughs> things we should about, have been paying closer attention. <laughs> about George W. Bush. And well, and not so much, you know, because of any deficiencies of Cheney, although, you know, 
we could talk about that another time, but more because, I mean, it's projecting, ah, you know, I, I very clearly lack the experience, mm-hmm. or at least, you know, kind of I feel that I lack the familiarity, which is one reason why, you know, when people suggest that Obama select a running mate on the basis of experience, it seems like a very unwise because it seems to be this acknowledgement that in fact I am a naif. Yeah, <laughs> I, right. don't I, really know I, I don't know what the hell is going on here. I need someone <laughs> to hold my hand. Well, so so who do you think you should pick, or what kind of person? Let's well, all I, I mean, my my just very you know fervent belief is that he not select Hillary Clinton. I think that would, uh, I mean, just you know, it's interesting because I mean, clearly George H. W. Bush and Reagan had you know very testy exchanges during the Republican presidential primary in 1980. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I can understand that, you know, you reconcile, you reach out to people, that there's some logic to that. But, I mean, given the nature of that campaign, given the nature of her attacks, I mean, I suppose there's the notion that it's better to have someone, you know, uh, urinating inside the tent, uh, or rather <laughs> rather outside the tent rather than inside right, the tent. Right. There's that. But um, I like, you know, so many other people, I think that Jim Webb um, has really handled himself very impressively. I mean, he's clearly not, you know, the best campaigner necessarily, yeah, but right, I mean, his right, story resonates right. with people. And also, I mean, I think that... And he's if not you a look governor, at, another yeah. senator, the people... But at the same time, when you look at, you know, for example, criticism. his uh, veterans' educational benefits proposal and how, you know carefully and how craftily he designed it and how he brought 75 Republicans on board, it actually demonstrates a sophistication about legislative strategy, which actually seems like it would be a good and useful thing for Obama yeah, and he seems like a candidate who uh, were worried about the white working class yeah. uh, potential of, of Obama. He's someone who, who should and, uh, appeal to exactly those, those kind of voters. So he kind of fits into well. uh, and an ex-Republican, and you yeah. know, Obama seems quite sincere about wanting to reach Republicans, um, obviously, it would be to his benefit. Uh, and you know, what Hillary gets you putting him on, putting her on the ticket is you ensure that no Republicans will vote for him, <laughs> and that in fact you'll drum up voter enthusiasm on, on the other side. So, yeah, I mean, I have a little trouble with that that idea. I mean, if you're sort of in the right frame of mind and you had a couple of drinks, maybe it seems like a good idea. But I think in the cold light of day, you know, it's just why would you borrow that trouble? <laughs> there's got to be a better way. <laughs> Who are some other vice presidential picks that you would not be offended by? <laughs> well, another uh, pick from the state of Virginia would be Tim King. Yeah. People talk uh, quite positively about him, and I think with good reason. Uh, Ted Strickland from Ohio, a Clinton booster, uh, who is, again, a, you know, obviously a critical state and, and a, the kind of guy who would appeal to white working class voters. He obviously brings something to the table too, and sort of the religious I think you would side make up for things. the mistake of not choosing Gephardt in two thousand four, uh, because I mean it seems like someone who really does move voters in Ohio extremely popular there. Yeah, yeah, no, and, they just they just yeah. love him. So uh, I think he would be defensible, and you know, there's there's arguments for choosing a woman like Kathleen Sebelius or Janet Napolitano. Um, and there's, there's millions of, literally millions of other choices. But, uh, you know, I've been mentioned by some. As advice, but I'm not running. I want to make that clear. Well, I think that the trouble with both of us is that we both have very difficult names to pronounce. Yeah, yeah. Ah, so forget, if... forget about it. Forget about it. My name was, you know, John Anderson or you know, something like that. That's the kind of name you need to run. You know? Well, I actually think that the one thing that you would do, I think if you were a Republican, then you actually might be able to move Portuguese voters in central Massachusetts. Right, the all-important all Portuguese block. Yeah, I... <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's something that I think the Obama campaign should think more about. And let's face it, we Portuguese, we don't get a lot of love, you know. We're not talked about a lot. There's a lot of simmering resentment about that. <laughs> You know, what I want to know about, this is slightly tangential, but yeah. is there a rivalry between, uh, you know, the Portuguese and the Brazilians? Uh, is there a sense that the Brazilians are kind of horning in on your Portuguese language turf? Well, there, there is some rivalry for sure. Uh, on the other hand, I guess, well. sometimes Portuguese look, look upon Brazilians as, well, at least they speak the language, so if they're going out there and winning the World Cup and stuff like <laughs> that, I mean, it's a little bit, you know, us in them, so... That and if sense. Portugal drops out, then you can root for Brazil. So, <laughs> of course, with the European Cup coming up, all of us Portuguese are quite excited. I don't know if you're a soccer fan, but 
It's a pretty big uh, deal. I need to I need to start actually. Yeah, yeah so, you got to get with the program here. <laughs> so tell me about uh, on the Republican side. I mean, you know, you are uh, as a very sober analyst, uh, uh, very uh, very uh, down on uh, Republican chances in two thousand eight. I think that's fair to say. Uh, <laughs> is there, not a good year, probably. Uh, so <laughs> I think that I think that's just you know the cold hard truth talking. But um, you know, tell me, is there a vice presidential candidate for McCain that you think you know would be a shrewd move, someone oh, who you know could um, play to some of McCain's strengths? Well, I'll give you a shout out on this. How about Tim Pawlenty? You know, a guy who could uh, maybe bring in more of those Sam's Club Republicans that you guys wrote about in your seminal article, you and Ross. He does a while have ago. a. He does come from a modest background. Candidate. He has an appealing biography in that regard. But one thing that's interesting is that, you know, he, uh, you know, barely won uh, re-election. And, uh, you know, not that, you know, that was just a tough year for Republicans mm-hmm. uh, everywhere. But, I mean, it is interesting uh, that, I mean, he is the, he is a name that comes up when people think about a Republican candidate who can connect with working class voters. Right. Um, and, again, this gets it back to our theme about, well, if yeah. you're Republicans, what do you need to do to win? You need to keep it locked in terms of that super majority of white working class voters. I mean, even if you drop down to, like, 12 points, and actually looking at the structure of the electorate, as I think it's likely to be in this election, uh, you know, they may, in fact, lose if it's even wider than that. I mean, 13 points, 14 points, right? So, you know, you need a candidate and a ticket who can have that margin at probably 15 points or more to really, to really be safe. And, you know, therefore, you need to send the right message to these voters that this is your ticket. And maybe Tim Pawlenty could, could, could help at the margin. In terms of maybe it would help contrary. push McCain yeah. toward... And embrace of more of these kinds of issues. I have no idea. I mean, wh- yeah. what is McCain going to run on in terms of economics? Which, I, last I checked, voters were pretty concerned about, and probably are somewhat less worried about whether Obama is going to talk and with what conditions to, you know, the head of Iran. Carlin Bowman uh, raised an interesting idea uh, when uh, we were uh, having a conversation a couple of days ago, and uh, she introduced this intriguing notion that during economic downturns, oh, voters right. become yeah, very yeah. skeptical mm-hmm. about, mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, big government. They become, yeah, they become very skeptical about. Yeah, risk yeah, yeah. And uh, I thought that this was a really neat idea. I haven't really uh, drilled down into the numbers, but uh, I hope that Carlin is going to write something about this soon. Uh, but certainly, you know, if you look at 1992, when Perot was basically calling for some mm-hmm. a combination of protectionism and economic austerity, mm-hmm. um, you know, he was certainly not uh, in a generous mood. There was this broadly held sense. And I was thinking that, I mean, certainly the composition of the electorate looks very different from, you know, what it looked like in 1992. A lot of those pro voters are very, very old. Uh, many are dead. <laughs> and oh, man. Also, you know, the population has shifted away from Sad. a lot of those states. Yes. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, it did seem interesting because, you know, Clinton was the candidate who was calling for large-scale reforms to the welfare state, including expansions of the welfare state, and the two other candidates were not, and the two other candidates won a pretty, you know, big majority that time around. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you know, McCain has really emphasized, and, you know, one area that, you know, many of McCain's Democratic critics have pointed out is a real point of differentiation between him and Bush is his anti-pork barrel spending crusade. Mm-hmm. Is it possible that that, I mean, what do you think about that? I mean, do you think that that's something that, you know, is going to... Uh, obtain this year, or do you think that it's a lot less salient, the spending well, issues? I think, I think it's an issue he will bring up and will probably be of some assistance to him. I just think it's unlikely to be enough to, to trump the Democratic cards in terms of, well, the economy's in the tank, you know, we're in a recession. <laughs> Al Bush was in office the last, last time we checked. Uh, McCain seems to want to do the same thing. He wants to Keep the tax cuts for the rich. He doesn't really have any other ideas. Health care, you're pretty much on your own. Um, I just, you know, these are big things in voters' minds, I think, at this point. They're, they're really pretty unhappy with the way the country is going. They're really extremely unhappy with how the economy is going. And I just don't think that even while they may detest pork barrel spending, that that's yeah. going to be uh, sufficient to get them off of the, kind of get them to turn their gaze elsewhere. Uh, I mean, but he needs conversation changers. I mean, I think... He's going to try to do this in a variety of different ways. I think his, his natural inclination by personality and history is to do it on national security grounds. He wants to have a long and detailed conversation about 
whether and how we should talk to the president of Iran. He wants to have long and detailed conversations about uh, various issues concerned with the war on terrorism and, uh, you know, what will happen if Iraq collapses and, you know, won't Al Qaeda take over the entire Middle East. So he feels probably, possibly rightly, that that's where his greatest strength may lie. And the more you can get voters to talk about that, you know, sort of our imminent danger of national security collapse, the better off he is. That, it's you know, even though Obama's a naive you know, in, a, in a dangerous world, and I'm not. Even though uh, the Republican advantage on national security has eroded, it does seem that it's one of their few areas where they have at least some, you know, advantage. Right, in a very uh, generic, you know. broad sense. I mean, it used to yeah, be... Yeah, not even specifically Iraq, but rather just... Not even specifically the war yeah. on terrorism. I mean, even yeah. that, the uh, the advantage is, is, is pretty much gone. I mean, if you look at... The, there's Post data that show, Washington Post data, that show the at least a party's advantage on the campaign against terror was... About 36 points in 2002, it had been cut in half by the 2004 election and it vanished by around the time of the, the congressional election and it hasn't really moved much since. So it ain't exactly an area of strength for the Democrats, but no longer so obviously an area of strength for the Republicans, where at least in these party comparisons they still look good, is if you kind of make it much more broad than even, I mean the campaign against terrorism is an actual like item, an action item, yeah. whereas you talk more generally about safeguarding the country, okay, right. or about protecting the homeland, or about, ah, the best, maintaining a strong military. That's where you see the Republicans still have right. serious advantages. So, so it's, it's kind of like he, he has to get the level of generality up in terms of talking about security issues. The more it's specific it is, where people are going to actually compare the Republican, the Bush administration record to what's actually happened, the, the, I think the worse a conversation it's going to be for him, which and that's going to be a, a delicate dance for him, a tough one. I mean, uh, he may he's still be holding on to the idea that he can convince people he's the guy who, you know, we need to win in Iraq, and we shouldn't leave, and we should stay there for a long time, and the surge is working, and, uh, you know, let's stick with it, which is, I, th I think, a very much a losing proposition. The surge is now seen much less favorably in people's eyes as something that's made a difference. Uh, and we, we know that in terms of your people's sort of bottom line judgments about whether the war is a mistake, uh, whether it was worth doing, uh, and whether we should leave, all those things are at higher levels than they were before the surge even started at this point. Peter so Fever. this is just a, yeah. you know, Peter Fever, I know, he has this analysis that, yeah. well, if you, if you can just convince people you're going to win, then that's the key. So long as people think you're not going to win, it's over. But if you can move the needle back to thinking you can win, uh, but I, I don't see how you can do that. Yeah, and he's also talked more recently about how, you know, you actually need to go back to the argument for why we invaded. Uh, and, mm -hmm. you know, if you can actually try to move some voters on that issue. I, you know, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm in a bind because I both, you know, broadly believe in McCain's approach mm -hmm. to the Iraq war. But I also agree that the issue environment, if, I think if you're looking at where voters are, uh, they're in a very different place. And I think that that's going to be something that's very difficult, particularly since uh, I think that, you know, McCain's rhetorical style in terms of how he talks about these issues, he actually often will take the most difficult route, um, you know, rather than emphasize the fact that he wants to uh, lighten the footprint, he'll emphasize that we need to be there for a very long period of time. Right, well, uh, is this sort of the to move a little version bit of the Walter Mondale approach, you know? Uh, the other guy, <laughs> right. you know, Reagan, he won't tell you he'll raise taxes. Right, exactly. I will, you know, so McCain's going to say, they won't tell you that we're going to stay in Iraq for a zillion years. But I will. Right. You know, I I'm going to tell the truth here. We are going to have to say, well, you know, look what happened to Walter Mondale. I mean, people don't necessarily like straight talk. If it's yeah. straight talk, they don't want to hear in which the, with which they strenuously disagree. I think that's a very astute observation. Another thing that, I mean, you know, clearly uh, I think that you and I disagree about the relative merits of the approaches to health care, but I do agree that it comes far more natural. I, it, it's just... It comes more naturally for McCain to talk about pork barrel spending rather than to talk about uh, health care and about how we need to reform health care along these lines. Ron Brownstein had an interesting column recently about how actually McCain is calling for a fundamentally far more sweeping right. approach right. to health care than the Democrats. The Democrats basically want to deepen and extend uh, a broadly – familiar form of healthcare delivery, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's going to cost more money and it's going to be, but they just, you know, believe that, uh, 
they're extending it rather than moving in the direction of truly socialized medicine, something along those lines. And what McCain wants to do is really change the shape of the healthcare marketplace. And, you know, that is something that is frankly yeah. a little frightening to people. I think so. Uh, you know, particularly you think, citizens. You think do I believe that he wants to change the structure of the healthcare marketplace? I, well, first of all, I'm not sure how deeply he thinks about these issues, but I do believe that he buys into the idea. Mm-hmm. Because I think, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I actually think that's the right approach myself. The difference that I have with a lot of Republicans is probably in terms of the resources that's going to take in order to transition us from where we are to where we want to be. Um, but, I mean, I, I do, you know, personally think that's the better way to go. But mm-hmm. again, he just doesn't have... I think the rhetorical tools to talk about that effectively, particularly, and also, as you say, in terms of changing the conversation, you know, even if Republicans had great plans on a lot of these right. domestic issues. Do you really issues, want to be talking about exactly. healthcare? Exactly. Do you really want to be talking about healthcare? And I think right. that that's yeah. why, you know, the British example is so interesting. It, I mean, you know, now the British conservatives are thrilled. They're winning elections. They're winning elections by really big margins. But again, you know, the last time they were in government was in 1997. In terms of cohort replacement, a lot of the people who remember the foibles of, you know, the major government, I mean, they're enough time has passed to allow people to forgive and forget. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, because as long as Bush is on the stage, and as long as the Democrats spend a lot of money associating McCain with Bush, I mean, you're absolutely right. It's just, and and again, I do believe that Republicans do have some decent ideas on domestic policy uh, questions where they have just lost a lot of credibility uh, because of the failures of the Bush. Well, let, let me ask you, if you were running the zoo, so to speak, uh, what are the couple of things you'd have McCain talk about I think that would that... maximize his chances of winning? <laughs> I wasn't expecting to answer this question. That's very devious of you. Uh, I would definitely want some kind of big-ticket uh, reform that's oriented toward uh, mothers with children and mm-hmm. also, and, mm-hmm. and just in general, uh, families with children, uh, including some you know big-ticket, probably fairly expensive uh, tax solution uh, that could involve income splitting or it could involve, oh, and looking at child care would be something that would be designed to accommodate uh, mothers, both who work outside the home, but also who work in the home. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would use, you know, McCain has this language of shared sacrifice that he draws on that's been something that's, you know, part of his appeal. And the idea of valuing the sacrifice made by working mothers, I think, would be something that would be very, very resonant. Mm -hmm. And I think that, Mm -hmm. you know, if you're looking at non-college educated white women, uh, you know, that was an area of of tremendous vulnerability in 2006, and that was an area of some considerable strength in 2004. Right. In fact, if you look at why the um, Republicans won the 2004 election in sort of an accounting framework, how can you account for the shift? toward Bush between 2000 and 2004, you can account for a good chunk of it, a uh, majority, and maybe it's more like 60 65%, just on the basis of the movement of working-class white women yeah. toward the Republicans. And of that, a huge chunk of that was married yeah, by working-class women. Absolutely. So I think, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I, I think that there's some evidence that Obama will have some uh, vulnerabilities in, in that area. So... Yeah, that sounds like a smart move. Thank God that it won't be smarter than McCain. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting to me because, I mean, I think that also McCain has this incredibly masculine profile mm-hmm. as a candidate. I mean, he talks about war. He talks about, right. I mean, that's what, he talks that's about what he really gets into honor. it, right? That's when he's yeah. happy. No, you know, exactly. He's talking about, like, you know, how what he's going to do for the health care system and health savings accounts. He just doesn't sound like he's that animated about That's why I think that a running mate who could humanize him and someone who would actually be articulate talking about family issues and the issues facing American women, Mm -hmm. uh, I think would be a great thing. And also just, you know, it's it's funny because, I mean, the way that I think about this, for me it's, you know, building a candidate from scratch rather than this particular candidate who, again, I act a vehicle for the kind of conservative politics that I, you know, value Mm -hmm. and think represents Mm -hmm. the future of the Republican Party. Um... So, because, you know, as you say, I mean, you know, even let's say, you know, he did magically acquire the ability to talk about these issues. He's then on very unfriendly terrain. But unfortunately, I mean, the Republicans are boxed in. They need to uh, make advances on this unfriendly terrain. They need to, I mean, the Bush administration actually had some success, at least early on, early in on, terms yeah. of neutralizing mm-hmm. education, mm-hmm. at least, yeah, exactly. as an issue. Yeah. Though education was never one of the most salient issues, they mm-hmm. certainly did talk about it enough, and they had enough kind of detailed plans uh, to kind of pass a credibility threshold. Um, and, you know, even though there actually does appear to be a fair bit of consensus between centrist Democrats and Republicans about education issues, it's certainly not something that he's going to trumpet as a tremendous strength. It, it's just something where, 
you know, there aren't real accomplishments. And one idea that uh, James Capretta, you know, recently wrote about is the, if you look at the Medicare prescription drug benefit, mm -hmm. this is something that was broadly pretty popular. There were a lot of missteps, but it's, mm -hmm. you know, a benefit that proved popular with voters. And yet there are reasons conservatives just, you know, uh, congenitally aren't capable of bragging about <laughs> having brought home the bacon. And, you know, fair enough. I mean, there are some conservatives, some thoughtful conservatives, who say this was actually a pretty smart modernization right. um, and reform that actually kind of delivered the goods. So, but so would that be your second plan? Way. For, um, for McCain, that he should talk about the, the, this prescription drug it benefit? It couldn't be, that, because he, of course, voted against it. And that he should it. maybe <laughs> expand. Right, well, okay. But, yeah. you know, he was against some things before he was for him. Yeah. He was for some things before he was against him. So he's got a, <laughs> you know, he's, he's flexible. Well, this is why Yuval Levin has, I think, the smartest broad framework for McCain, which is taking the lesson, uh, the the language of reform, and the lessons of you know some of the good things the Bush administration did with regard to Medicare prescription drug benefit, etc., mm -hmm. and then trying to craft a, this idea of reforming all of our large scale institutions. I think Yuval is one of the mm -hmm. you know real bright stars in the conservative firmament, and I think that this idea allows mm -hmm. uh, McCain to talk about the malefactors of great wealth. It allows him to talk about broken bureaucracies. It allows him to talk about the way that government is failing, um, you know, families and neighborhoods uh, in a way that, you know, kind of aligns it with a kind of moralistic crusade, <laughs> which is, you know, the way that he tends to talk about stuff rather than in the roll up your shirt sleeves, let's solve problems, I know this domestic policy in great detail. So, uh, you know, and I think that he's also someone who is drawn to a lot of big ticket reforms. The trouble is, the danger is, that a lot of the big ticket reforms that conservatives like me want to see are things that, you know, scare the living daylights out of voters. <laughs> so, you right. know, he would need to craft these proposals very carefully. Oh. But I think that mm -hmm. that idea of a crusade in terms of domestic policy um, mm -hmm. would actually be something that would line up pretty well with his strengths. So besides the... Um the sort of the new program for uh, 21st century families, working mothers, whatever you want to call it, um, what would be another big ticket item? Would it be really the stuff around health care then that you were kind of, I mean, you wanted a more sweeping approach than McCain. Yeah, I just uh, want to. But I mean, somewhat along yeah. the same lines. I mean, well, they I should more expensive, more. Yeah, I think that that would be a good way to go. The trouble is that I think that in terms of the agenda that I'd want to see, he wouldn't be able to sign up for the Bush tax cuts. I mean, there are some tax cuts that he could definitely sign up for. I think the the idea that, you know, I find most appealing, and I certainly haven't poll tested this, but is the idea that we want the lowest taxes over the longest period of time, mm -hmm. which means that you don't, you know, finance them through debt on future generations to the extent you can avoid that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that it's more about modernizing the tax code. These are issues that I don't think really move voters very much. It's too abstruse. It's too yeah, strange. Yeah, it moves yeah, like some small number of activists. Um, but I think that, you know, certainly my, you know, big ticket thing would be some kind of reform that would actually look at the payroll tax, uh, you know, which is the tax that most Americans pay. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, particularly for working class uh, voters, it's the one that impacts them the most. So I would want to look at some big ticket reform of that. I would also look at retirement security, but emphasis on security, emphasis on ways that we can, you know, gin up savings. These are a lot of ideas that, frankly, Clintonite Democrats have embraced um, and that, you know, I think Republicans could uh, also embrace and could also mm -hmm. take in different directions um, and, you know, kind of marry them with. Sure. For example, the one idea that is very attractive to me, and this is an idea that Phil Longman at the New America Foundation has championed, is this idea of early retirement accounts. Rather than carve something out from Social Security, let's, you know, say, you know what, we can have people retiring at 62 under the system because it's going to undermine it over the long term. So let's say that you can still retire at 62 if you're drawing on your early retirement account. Mm -hmm. And then when people have it, they're actually going to be more inclined to stay in the workforce for a longer period of time because they feel like they actually And where do these early retirement accounts come from? The early retirement accounts would be just an add-on account mm -hmm. that you would use. But you would be okay. using it It's for, an account like the, this is like a... Is this like the universal 401k that yeah exactly you know, people it's here at the like Center that. for American Progress? Have, I mean, you, exactly. But everyone but has it. You can contribute as much money to it as you want. But you also get a match. Exactly. It could be something. It could be something like that. But the basic idea is that you're using it because as a sweetener because we're making it harder for you to use the current system to retire early. So, I mean, that's the unattractive part, but mm -hmm. that's the part where you're talking about the shared sacrifice and you're talking about putting the system on a sounder footing. 
Um, and that's mm-hmm. something where you would have to craft some kind of bipartisan compromise in all likelihood. Right, right. But I think that the the basic idea is, you know, we're going to use a private account approach, but we're not going to use it, um, you know, to... It's uh, not going to be a carve-out on social Exactly, security. exactly. Yeah. We're, we don't want to use it to undermine the current system. We want to use it to put the system what, on what is, what is McCain's position on social security uh, Well, he's always been a big social security account. reform booster. But the trouble is, uh, you know, because I think that it actually jives with him pretty well ideologically. But in terms of thinking about the actual institutional design, I think that he has tried to steer clear of that, which, you know, makes sense because, again, it's an area where the more you talk about the details when you're departing from the system as it exists, uh, you know, you get into more dangerous territory. Now, the opening would be if Obama started talking more explicitly about, you know, donut holes and uh, increasing the Social Security payroll tax for some, etc., then you could, when you're actually getting into that territory, but frankly, you know, strategically, I can see why both campaigns want to steer clear Mm -hmm. of that kind of thing. Um, But I think that, you know, that could be a winner if you talk talked about it in a way that it's radically different from how the Bush White House talked about it. Um, And I think that, you know, I I mean, in our book, we have a lot of ideas, but a lot of these ideas are things that, you know, frankly, just don't fit McCain very well. And they're ideas that are going to only take on more salience uh, and political realizability if Republicans lose. So while I do want want McCain to win... um, you know, that's a probable scenario, probable evolution, is they do lose this election. And at, at that point, um, ideas for reform could potentially become more salient because people are looking for interpretations, ideas, explanations, what's the road forward. Uh, but how likely do you think that will be, at least in an immediate sense? I mean, there's lots of scenarios for my, how this might turn out. Maybe if McCain loses... Uh, conservatives in the party are just even more annoyed than ever that oh, this yeah. was totally the wrong approach. I mean, the problem with McCain is he wasn't a true conservative. He couldn't stand up to that insane liberal Barack Obama. I mean, this is ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> we've got to get back to basics here. So who is going to drag the party kicking and screaming toward its rendezvous with a reformed destiny? I mean, who's going to take every... You know, leading Republicans, sit them down with a copy of Brand New Party and make them read it from (laughs) cover to cover. Well, look, I'm actually in a very awkward spot because I'm a single-issue voter. I mean, the issue that I vote on is Iraq, and though Uh I actually don't think that Obama is a wildly irresponsible person, I don't believe that at all. I think that he Mm -hmm. wants to do the right thing. I do basically believe that McCain would is the person that I'd like to see win. Okay, uh, so you're going to vote for, for McCain. Reason. You heard it here first. <laughs> Which I, I don't think really comes as much of a shock. But <laughs> so that said, I mean, you're right that, you know, if he loses, that's going to open up a lot of ferment and a lot of space. And mm-hmm. I think that one possible reaction is, you know, look at a figure like Mike Huckabee. Mm-hmm. Mike Huckabee is someone who, you know, I think I have some instinctive sympathy for the fact that he is trying to be more creative at, about domestic policy, and he does, you know, have an instinctive concern, sympathy, empathy with the white working class. At the same time, I mean, I worry that he also embodies the transformation of the Republican Party into a rump regional party of southern white evangelicals. Right. And yeah, I he's think a little the, bit crazy, let's face it. So. Well, the message that I want to, well, I'm not sure if he's crazy, but I also think that a lot of his ideas are half-baked. Well, partly they, they because, would be crazy viewed outside of a certain regional and cultural yeah, context. Yeah, and exactly. I mean, he's, he's certainly very for, alien. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's kind of like John Kerry. I mean, you know, John Kerry is someone who comes out of a very particular regional culture, and it's a regional culture that actually doesn't jive well with a lot of Americans. And, you know, I think the same is true of Huckabee. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's mm-hmm. very distinctive. So um, Huckabee may be a flawed messenger. Uh, whereas I think that if you look at both Obama and McCain, these are both people who come from quirky regional backgrounds. Um, you know, McCain really moved around a tremendous amount. I mean, he's someone who, you know, his nationalism derives in part from his uh, close association with the military coming from a military family. And Obama, similarly, mm-hmm. you know, uh, grew up in Hawaii and, and you know, in a variety of uh, big cities. So I think that... Um, you know, the danger is, yeah, that you're going to have this um, further regionalization of the Republican Party. And the idea that I find increasingly attractive that I hope to write more about, more about is his 50-state strategy for the Democrats. The Republicans need a 50-state strategy. They need to find a way to win back. I mean, I'm from uh, Brooklyn, and it's interesting because, you know, one of the last uh, Republicans in the New York metropolitan area, Vito Fisella, is <laughs> now, you know, is now not going to run for re-election, and mm-hmm. he's been utterly disgraced. And, you know, that's the kind of constituency uh, it's a uh, you know, a lot of white working class voters, heavily mm-hmm. Catholic, but you had constituencies like that throughout Long Island, for example, uh, throughout northern New Jersey. And, uh, 
you just see fewer and fewer Republicans who can win in that terrain. Mm -hmm. And I think that you you need a Republican Party that can win back those voters. And I know that you and I have talked about this a bit. You know, is it um, is it going to be a cultural moderate who is going to be someone more economically populist? I tend to think that you know, there it's also about reviving what cultural conservatism means. Um, okay, what remember, do you mean by that? Reviving well, Gertrude culture. Himmelfarb had a really uh, interesting book a couple of years back. I believe it was called One Nation, Two Cultures, and she talked about how when you look at uh, great awakenings in the American tradition, they mm-hmm. begin as sectarian awakenings, but then they eventually become a broader moral revivalism that becomes uncoupled mm-hmm. from. Um, uh, a particular sectarian tradition. And uh, back in 2000, I remember David Brooks and Bill Crystal were talking about how, you know, the McCain majority would replace the decaying Reagan majority by, Mm -hmm. you know, its cultural conservatism would be a kind of civic conservatism, would become a kind of moral and patriotic revivalism that, you know, would be very different. Yeah, like a national greatness conservatism? Was that a trope at one point? That was. And I think that, again, the resonance of that kind of thing now is, but I, I find the idea of a cultural conservatism that is is really not so much about uh, sectarian, you know, religious beliefs, but is more about uh, authority in the schools. It's more about the idea that you know we so should all. So it becomes less associated standard. with the Christian right, and exactly. becomes more associated with conservative civic. Exactly, it's the idea of you know okay. the idea of public order and the idea that you know and actually a lot of its ideas that you know Obama is actually you know injected right. into the public discourse. Probably would have some sympathy for. Yeah. yeah, it's the idea you know of a kind of you know one nation conservatism mm-hmm. that emphasizes mm-hmm. what kind of brings us together and it would also involve, for example, you know uh, a third way on immigration that emphasizes assimilation uh, and that emphasizes. Right. Speaking of immigration, how street. do you think yeah. uh, McCain's going to handle the immigration issue? Well, it's I mean, interesting he's... because he's actually said comprehensive again. Uh, you know. Know, he's he's dropped that term, and then conservatives have, of course, howled about it. Um, how do you think he's going to handle it? I have my I'm, own thoughts, but I'm curious to hear what you think. I'm not really sure. I mean, I, I find it hard to see how he gets away with championing his original position on this as the candidate of the Republican Party. I think he's going to have to on lower the, the heat hand, on the issue. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it. it, it I mean, he wants to be able to reach into the Hispanic base of. The Democrats, especially, you know, the theory is Obama's going to be relatively weak there. Yeah. Uh, but how do you do that unless you're willing to highlight the ways in which you are different from the other Republican politicians? <laughs> so I, I, but if you do that, then you get a, a lot of annoyed Republicans out there who like, I mean, talk about an issue that generates a lot of heat on the Republican side that uh, has a, you know, a sort of a set of activists who will absolutely be <laughs> apoplectic if this becomes part of the mix. So... Uh, I think it's a no-win. I just don't see how he finesses this, and which which means to me he's just not going to say much about it. But I, could I have wrong. my own totally crazy solution to this okay. issue, which is a solution where we, we like actually crazy. pursue. Uh, I believe that we should actually pursue stronger, direct relations with Mexico where we actually talk about how we can intelligently integrate our economies. Now, I realize this is something that conservatives don't like to talk about. But when I say say integrate, what I mean is, you know, what if you had an arrangement where we talk about, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to decontrol migration for people over the age of 65 so that larger numbers of Americans will settle in Mexico and -hmm. this will generate employment. We also talk about how, you know, when you're looking at a lot of migrant laborers, they're actually leaving spouses behind. Mm -hmm. And whereas if actually both both were together. If you had two earners, then you would have roughly the same income. But when you mm-hmm. have one migrant laborer and you have one spouse who stays behind, you have essentially a single parent family with all the intended consequences. You have these communities uh, in Mexico that resemble inner city communities in the United States. I think that when you try to think intelligently about what are comprehensive strategies that are going to be win-win for both sides, where you're actually going to you know, gradually reduce the number of migrants. So I think that actually you could craft some kind of agreement where Mexico is going to be responsible for the influx into the United States, but you know, in return we're actually going to talk with them about you know, meeting some of their infrastructure bottlenecks right, and also right. things that we could do. Now, I, now, I have to sounds... say the chances that McCain will adopt this <laughs> approach I think is minimal, but perhaps yeah. I'm... Well, look, I mean, here's yeah. why, I mean, the things that I'm interested in are, are matters of, you know, kind of 10, 15-year strategy, because I think that a big That's part good. of this is That's also going to be... That's why people should read more science fiction, right? <laughs> Something well, this we is all a mutual on. obsession uh, of ours. <laughs> yeah, I mean... <laughs> 
I, I also think that a lot of it's about candidate recruitment because you need Mexican American candidates mm-hmm. who are going to say, you know, we're not hostile to Mexican Americans. Mexico is a key partner of this country, and also it's a key part of the heritage of millions of Americans. Mm-hmm. So the idea of a, a Mexico being our enemy is nonsense. At the same time, we have shared needs, and we also have some shared priorities that we can work on more intelligently rather than having, say, a conservative would want to say Mexico exporting some of its you know social problems uh, to the United States or vice versa. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, actually, we do need to talk about science fiction, but I see now that we're almost yeah. Hour. I think we're we're running uh, <laughs> we're to the end to, of our allotted time. <laughs> we're going to need to have another shame. special edition exclusively science on the singularity. fiction edition. Right yeah. in the meantime, you gotta <laughs> gotta start cracking that Alistair Reynolds uh, reading list. I oh, I'm so, so excited about that. Yeah, I actually, I'm going to be writing a short science fiction story for Double Think, which I will send to you. Really? Oh, I'd like to see yeah. that. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot, Rui. I really appreciate hey, it's your been time. a gas. Talk to you soon. All right. See you. Bye.